it's time for scripts and scripture disclaimers. Gene Verhoeven here with some very important information. My panel and I just finished watching this film. Some people use this show to see if they want to see the movie, and some people watch the movie first and then listen to us. The list is available at WICXradio.org. If you're part of the first group, then beware, there are plot spoilers in the following discussion. We also have to tell you, while we think they are smart, witty, insightful, and profound, our opinions are solely ours and do not reflect the management, staff, or board of WICX or affiliated radio groups, or maybe even you. However, our panel is very proud of the results. We are not theologians or apologists, but we are movie fans and hope you are too. Enjoy. Ready? Lights, camera, action! Take one. That clapboard tells us it's time for scripts and scriptures. I'm Jean Verhoeven. Watching spiritually inspired films and shows and discussing the quality, insight, value, and enjoyment. I'm so happy to welcome my panel, Susan Stevens, Charlie Saletti, Lloyd Kent, and host of his own movie radio show, As the Real Turns, Daniel Saletti. The Letters is a 2014 American biographical drama directed and written by William Reed. The film stars Juliet Stevenson, Max von Sydow, Rutger Hauer, and Priya Darshini. Mother Teresa, Juliet Stevenson, is the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize and is considered one of the greatest humanitarians of modern times. Her selfless commitment changed hearts, lives, and inspired millions throughout the world. The film is told through the personal letters she wrote over the last 40 years of her life and reveal a troubled and vulnerable woman who grew to feel an isolation and an abandonment by God. The story is told from the point of view of a Vatican priest, Max von Sydow, charged with the task of investigating acts and events following her death. He recounts her life's work, her political oppression, her religious zeal, and her unbreakable spirit. When the time came to cast the film, Rhea had a wealth of actresses clamoring to don Mother Teresa's habit. To play her confessor, Father Van Exum, Rhea cast Max von Sydow, the Swedish star who had been a favorite of directors ranging from Ingmar Bergman to Martin Scorsese. When von Sydow asked the director for some insight into the character, Rhea gave him a simple but telling answer. I said the whole world looked up to Mother Teresa, he recalls, and Mother Teresa looked up to Father Van Exum. He just looked at me for a long moment and he said, got it. And that was it. He showed up and knew exactly what to do. So how many of us would listen to the call? We know that Mother Teresa in this movie was very happy as a teacher but she knew that she was destined for something else. You know, she had, a, she had a nice gig there, private school, even though it was in a poor section, but she had um, high caste, if that's the right term, um, students. She loved teaching. How many of us would listen to the call? Would you? The call comes in mysterious ways and asks for mysterious deeds. This so. is true. I mean, if you're listening to the call, then you better answer it because no matter <laughs> no matter what it is, it's going to end up being good for not only you, maybe, but good for others. Well, it was more of an answer than a call because she went away on this retreat questioning what she should do and asking God what she should do. So she was open to, I guess, the call, but it was God answering her. And... What I found remarkable, or what was particularly remarkable for her, 
was that, as she described it, it was call within a call. Call within a she call. She already had her calling as a nun and as a, uh, a, and a, and a serving nun as a teacher. But then even f- from that already serving out her calling, felt a, yet another call. And don't forget she was forward. cloistered. She wasn't yeah. just a, uh, you know, every, uh, I don't want to say a regular nun. That doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean, an uncloistered one. Um, and speaking of calls, okay, so we all have our bosses that we have to report to. Was Mother General correct in sticking to their calling? I mean, she wanted, she thought, oh, this is a, this is a really nice whim, Teresa, but we, we should stick to our calling. We are a teaching order. I, I think she, she was an administrator, and it's just natural that she would stick up for, for that and, Maybe listen to the other thing, but still be consistent. I think sometimes if, after forty years in the convent or the seminary or the priesthood, you know, you you give yourself over to the administration or running of the parish or running of the diocese, and you kind of forget mm. or you get out of the habit of the religious stuff as much as much. Um, being cloistered seems to have closed the eyes of the other nuns regarding the poor that were like right outside the building. I mean, they all had windows. Why only Teresa saw uh, what was going on? She had the window in her classroom, but they all had windows. Oh, I don't think it was being cloistered. All her students were from India. They they knew no other life. They For them, the poor people in the streets were just how it was. It was maybe uh, for Teresa that uh, that that seemed unacceptable and 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 inexplicable because even though I suspect that she was not from a uh, from a wealthy part of the world originally, the level of poverty wasn't anywhere near what she was witnessing in the streets of Calcutta. But her students saw that every day, and well, you go blind to it. Right. Yeah. Well, the way I see it is that, you know, yes, they all had, all had windows, but she had uh, the decency to look out mm-hmm. the window, unlike mm. all the other ones. And so that's why I say it's good to be distracted and, and look outside the window sometimes when you're not doing your work because you miss something. Thank you very much, teachers. I, I was going to say, I think you've been told that before, right? Yes, I have, and they've all been wrong. All right. So you mentioned um, earlier a call mm. and then a call. Here's, I have, I have a really hard time with this. How do we know when it's God voice, God's voice and not our own thoughts? I mean, I know you're supposed to be still and know who I am or whatever the quote is, but I have a, I have a very hard time with that because I got this machine gun brain that just is firing all the time. And is it my thought? Is it God's thought? God forbid it's somebody else's thought. (laughs) Um, Are you hearing voices in your head again? No, no, no voices, but I don't know. How do we know? I know because God's got his methods with me that uh, if I don't pay attention, he uh, speaks louder. Ah, <laughs> you're lucky. And it usually hurts. Oh, it usually <laughs> hurts. Okay. I'll say I, mother heard the voice on the train, and I, I think I found two things with this movie that it have all but disappeared and it's very sad we have lost the art of letter writing let us let's remember the name of this movie was the letters we have lost the art of letter writing because email just doesn't cut it and look at those way cool trains we've lost (laughs) (laughs) as a regular form of transportation they were beautiful things but anyway do you have a way of telling whether you you think that's your own thought or i was always told it's God voice if it gives you peace. Yep, there's a priest on EWTN says that all the time. Well, one minute the Mother General, who's kind of the nemesis in this story, is understanding and offers options. And then the next minute she's calling poor Teresa's calling foolishness. Why do you think the swing? Why, do, why in the change of attitude? Well, it seems like Mother General has been around a long time. <laughs> And has had various sisters or novices um, having doubts. So she's no, she's like, I've seen it all. I know how to handle this. Ah, yeah, you may have something there. Yeah, my impression was that she was thinking that 
Teresa will go out, spend a few months, and then she'll be back. Crawling back. Crawl, <laughs> and then uh, and then she'll just, I'll just let her get it out of her system, and then that'll be over. Wasn't that a Hamilton song? <laughs> yeah. uh, you'll, you'll be, be back. back. <laughs> time will tell. Well, you know, um, I'm familiar with the Carmelites. Uh, That's the only credit I'll give it. The <laughs> cloistered. I think it, they're called decalcified. They're, I think that's the right term. Um, and they're so cloistered that they actually have what they call an outsister. And she does not live with the community. She lives separate, but she she deals with the public. She greets the people that they share the, the chapel with. And um, so when a nun is cloistered, they're, they're serious about it. <laughs> um, you know, you had to put groceries on a turntable and send them in and all that kind of stuff. They were behind a grill. You could you could converse with the Someone nuns. was on a turntable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, someone was on a turntable one time. Would, mm. um, there was a, yeah, there was a fellow that used to claim that his mother put him through so that the, nun, the nuns could play with him, and it was very cute. But anyway, um, there were those who still had, it seemed, more pride than poverty. Um Mother Teresa, in her early days, she felt that she was unwanted, but she was needed. What kept her going? I mean, she was dealing with those people who, they had nothing, but they were still proud and, and didn't didn't want her there. So what did she mean when she said she was unwanted, but needed, and, and what, what just kept her going every day? Well, probably that same calling that said, you have to do this, um, and... The yeah, you know, the need clearly was there, even if the some of the people who were around her, you know, didn't you know were afraid that she was there as a missionary to convert them from their from what they already had believed they had was a faith, so they didn't need somebody converting their children or or anything like that. But you know, she wasn't there for that, and um, no, she seemed yeah. adamant about not converting anybody she just wanted to give them a chance in life by some education because remember she was a teacher however um almost almost the exact definition of missionary is to go and evangelize and convert and so forth and so on but at least uh in her early days when she was just kind of getting into the neighborhood if you will <laughs> um she was just there to help which is pretty amazing or like, was she? Uh, no, I think I, I think she know. saw herself as a servant, servant mm -hmm. of God, and it didn't matter who she was serving. Right. Um, but at her roots, she was a teacher, so I think that she really enjoyed that part of it. Um, I'm reminded of the story about the starfish. Um, you know how all these starfish are brought up on on the beach, and they're all going to die. And there's one guy out there by himself, and he's picking up, picking them up one at a time and tossing them back. And there's hundreds or thousands of them. And, and uh, somebody said to him, what are you doing? You, there's no way you could get them all back in the ocean, and you're only helping a few. How, uh, why, why bother? And, and the guy says, well, if you were one of the few. You know? <laughs> so I think... That, that her ministry reminded me of that. It seems that she followed the same theory. Um, was serving and or saving only a few enough? Is, is it enough for her? Is it a, a Hebrew saying, you save one life, you save all of humanity? Yeah, I think you're right. But I just have this picture of Mother Teresa flinging starfish. <laughs> <laughs> all of, what, 90 pounds? Yeah, away? right. It was interesting. I heard an interview with the um, star there, Juliet Stevenson. Is that her the name? The starfish. The starfish, ah. right? And she, um, she's a British actor, and she said, "I'm of course she is. I'm like seven inches taller. I'm a larger frame than Mother Teresa, and of course, it, well, I don't know if she was a lot younger um, for the period that it was. It was probably I don't know what the age different what difference was." But she said she, it was a real challenge, and she loved it being a challenge, to kind of take on the persona. And you know how um, bent over, I thought that was in, just in the later years, but I, I think it was all the time. Oh but she God. was a little thing, a little tiny thing, much smaller than we see her in the movie. But, so tell me, why is it so important that someone 
so close to death, probably they're probably completely out of it at that point, be brought in, be cleaned up, and be comforted just for a few minutes, for the few last minutes on the earth, especially since they're non-Christians or, or non-Catholics and they don't, they have a totally different perception of death. Why was this so important? Well, I was always told it's a gift to be at two portions of a person's life. And the first, when they're newly from God, you know, just born baby. And another, as you're preparing them to meet God. So as someone mm. at birth and at death. Okay. Because there's a door, to, there's close to, there's a doorway from God. <laughs> and something very sacred about that. Uh, because, I mean, it took, it, it took little Mother Teresa plus a, a small group of other women who were schlepping these poor people uh, and just... In carts. Let's yeah, in carts and, and by hand and just bringing them in, laying them down cleaning them up a, a little bit, telling them they were loved, and then gone. So. But you're handing them over to God, in the hands of God. It was that, and, you know, as, as she said in her movie, in the movie, she said herself that, you know, she just wanted to have them be in the, uh, surrounded by people who love them, even if it was only for a short time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Very for, short time in some cases, yeah. For, for her, that was service enough. Right, right. In fact, she didn't even call her facility a hospital. Mm -hmm. I noticed at one point there was a sign that said hospice. I don't think she ever used the word, but um, that's pretty much what it was. Um, I think the student volunteers, especially that first one, I forget her name, should also be canonized because it took an awful lot of courage and zeal to join Mother. Uh, and I, I was thinking, I was trying to do the math, and I'm thinking probably most of that group is, has also died at this point, because this was like, what we, 1948 or so, this was happening. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the, in the 80s, there was a girl ahead of me in high school uh, who became a nurse after high school, and then um, she actually went and worked with Mother Teresa for a while, and it was amazing. And um, I don't know. Could you do it? No, because I'm not a woman. <laughs> no, that's not the point. Hey, there were men helpers. I know, I know, I know, I know. Could you do it? Could you leave behind all the comforts of home and? She, I mean, she, she, she went not with the intention of staying. It was like a one year or a two year assignment. Well, but... well even if it's with a dollar, know, basically five rubles. <laughs> even <laughs> even nice if it's a famously nun order. You know, I'm surprised I have not been asked yet because there have been so many times. Have you thought about the priesthood? And I just oh, about the priesthood. You're and very the... recruitable. What can I say? And yeah. so I'm going to add this to the no list because not only for that, but for I just don't think I could do it. I just you'd be I'm... grossed out. Well, no, it's just like I I don't think that it would be very. It I just I wouldn't get the same effect. I don't think Charlie would be very comfortable either. No, it would it would be out of my comfort zone and, for and sure. I'd I'd have to be realistic and say that it's not, it's just not something. That's that your comes calling naturally. and a calling. <laughs> However, as a you know, even even for Teresa, when she was first starting out, yeah, it was Whoa. she she was moved <laughs> right. by she was moved you know with pity for the poor, but it was far worse than she had anticipated, and even she was a little horrified at the first, and eventually. Just, and the first student, you know, she you know, had her, you know, the, her moment the, there. Uh, the, the doctor himself said, oh, well, you'll get used to it. And, well, so sure enough, she did. But, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not sure anyone could be prepared for it if they're from the, you know, from the comfortable part of the world. Yeah. Sometimes I forget, but, I mean, truly, 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 we don't have a clue how much of the world lives we just don't take for you know? granted clean oh. clean you know oh. water we can drink and we'll uh, walk over to the sink turn it on you know, let it dinner run. i don't even have to cook it yeah <laughs> i know it's you know, um, you just we forget we really forget and because it's like another planet it seems um so we know that there were a few couples or families there that wanted this christian woman 
out of their territory because uh, they were afraid that she was going to convert them, try to convert them or their children or whatever. But you know what? There's nothing like saving somebody's baby <laughs> to get them to turn around and help you. Um, they really came around when she was able to to help. Um, it was a, I think it was a breech birth or something, and she was able to help. And the father, without a doubt, even though he had, was probably the most outspoken against her, he was definitely grateful. It was, I just love the scene. It was beautiful. Right after the birth, he runs out. She's left. He runs after her. And there's no dialogue. There's only this nice music. And you, you see him just overwhelmed, overcome with um, uh, gratitude. And he falls to his knees and he kisses her feet. And it was beautiful. It was really nice. And, and he saw her her for what she really was right you know she wasn't this christian lady coming to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she saw somebody who just wanted to help and when kissing the knees it reminds me of that was that we are all beggars at the at oh. the foot of christ mm -hmm. that's true of course here's the real question should he have come to that conclusion earlier she never gave him any reason not to trust her or Whatever. Should, Maybe he should have, but it's just not human nature to... Bingo, to, I think. Notice that. <laughs> no, and you also have to remember this was just post, uh, what do they call it, partition India. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so a lot of the Indians had plenty of reason to distrust the foreigners who weren't always nice to them. Yeah. And it's human nature to be suspicious of at other was not, it's unlike you. Mm -hmm. So, um, our mother general here keeps showing up, and while she, you know, was kind of supportive in the beginning, look, all of a sudden it looks like she's losing potential postulants for her order to, shall we say, the competition, or Mother Teresa's, I actually wasn't an order yet, but to her group. Uh, she actually forbade, forbade the nuns to have anything to do with her and the students. Now, that wasn't very Christian, right? So was that the right attitude? Well, clearly not. No. Yeah, yeah, that was clearly that if it was as it was shown in the movie, she was, of course, a little jealous of the success Teresa was having and, and didn't, uh, as you say, like the competition. Let's remember um, that was the first newly found order in a right. hundred years in the Catholic right. Church. A hundred years. And Mother Teresa's always in running her. Mm, mm -hmm. um, okay, so poor Mother Teresa, the hardships and the hurdles, I mean, let's talk gigantic. But along the way, there did seem to be some major divine intervention. For example, the guy with the house. He was, not only was he a devout Christian, but he just happened to have a, <laughs> an empty floor on the top. And then the reversal of the attitude of the man with the baby. Um, there were about 10 students who came to help. And then there was the municipal government guy who uh, got the building for them. Or was it divine intervention or are we talking perseverance, good example, connections, networking, good luck, and, and so forth? Uh, is there a difference and or is it one or the other? I don't know. <laughs> It, you know what I would say. There are what no would you say? There are no coincidences. <laughs> That's right. But one thing that was I found interesting about Mother Teresa in the way she approached things was through prayer and patience. She wasn't. Lots she of didn't, patience. She didn't browbeat people. Right. She never. She never demanded of any of her superiors that she be given anything, um, even permission to leave the leave the convent and and go uh and go out among the poor she just patiently waited for the pope to give her permission and she was content to do that and uh now she always it, she kept saying it was god's will that right. she do that now here's right. the here's the question would she have given it four months six, i think she was up to four months would she have given it six months, 12 months, and said, I want to be laicized, I'm out of here, i got to answer this calling? Which would have, would, or would she have stuck with vows of obedience? Well, I mean, the, the Teresa that we see in the movie would have, 
would have remained obedient in trusting that God would do the right thing and that she would not have to be disobedient or in other ways break anything that, you know, do anything wrong to get what she thought she wanted because for her it was never about her. And, uh, and, that, and that was the way she almost approached everything, it seemed, and then things sort of just came to her. And she was good at taking advantage of them. But I'm just saying the pencil doesn't tell the hand what to write. Mm. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the she is a pencil in God's hand. Well, we're right. going to get to that actually. Um, Padre Pio, uh, pray, don't worry. It's so hard. <laughs> it's just so hard. Pray, don't worry. Yeah, I know. Well, of course, he had it harder than than we did, but yeah. I think I don't know that that's true faith. Sometimes I I uh, tease our station manager. I call him Reverend Mother when he says, you know, oh, so what? The bank account's empty. Don't worry, we'll get you know something will come through. It's like, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. Thanks, Reverend Mother. <laughs> but you know what? It usually does. So. I'm going to be perfectly honest here. If I was the mother of a teen and she wanted to A, join the convent, but B, go work in the slums of wherever, I, I'd have to think twice. I mean, can a young girl from a Catholic boarding school, and mind you, this was the 40s, really know her path? I mean, people at that age can be very idealistic and rather naive in the ways of the world. Plus, the, the American slums in some ways are the high rent district compared to Calcutta. Um, I don't know. How would you react if your if your daughter came to you and said, "Gee, I want to go in. The, I want to go help in the inner city, or I want to go help in the slums." Well, that was the funniest part of the movie, besides <coughs> besides Max von Sydow. But um, that was the funniest part of the movie when the two girls came to the came to the head nun there and said. Mother, we want to be priests. Oh, that's wonderful. Priests? Or, sorry, we want to be nuns. <laughs> there we go. That's wonderful. That was the funniest part, just her mm. reaction, because I thought, dear God, they must be really either low on nuns, or she gets way too excited, and there's something, and she's something, and there's she's hiding something. Mm. So that was the funniest part. But uh, yeah, I mean, like if you find out the person you've known for a while is all of a sudden, boom, they're becoming a nun or something like that. Or, like, if you were dating someone, they'd become a nun or something like that. It's like, wait, what? Huh? When did you When did you decide to do this? So I can see the shock value in that. It would shock any parent. Right. right. And in India so at the time, they, with the caste system... Oh, the caste system, that, right. It was a, it was a double uh, right. you know, no-no to be uh, doing what they were doing. And... Uh, and so, yeah, I can see why it would definitely distress the parents of these girls who had visions of them, you know, getting getting to an even better spot in life. And here they are in the minds of their parents, probably uh, stepping down and and dropping down a level. Mm-hmm. And probably the parents were expecting, oh, you're going to go off and become a, a wife and a mother and have a nice family and stuff like that. But now you can't do that. Someday I'll tell you about my uh, about my boyfriends <laughs> <laughs> who did not become nuns but <laughs> ended up in the seminary. But we won't we won't go into that today. Well, you know, I remember the shock though. <laughs> I, I, I'll I'll be. It was funny because it's kind of like a reverse thing for for me because I knew someone who I swear was going to become a nun. Right. Even played one in a play. Even played. Played one in a play. We thought, oh my gosh, she's going to become a nun. There's no talking about it. Well, remember, I think she had had illness as a child and and survived, and she was extremely grateful to God. And then one day I find out, oh, wait, no, she's getting married. Well, that's that's a vocation, too, you know. Um, Okay, so... But I had a thing for her, and I'm saying that on air. (laughs) Okay. So, um... Mother Teresa, she moves from the upper floor of the Christian man, uh, and she's gifted a building, at least for the usage of anyway, from the municipal government, which was pretty good, I thought. 
because word of her work was all over town. Was it good, was it bad, or was it just irrelevant that Mother's new building was a former temple? Nobody likes surprises, so the, yeah. Hindus, the Hindus would have been surprised that it was... Even being, though it was abandoned. But, even yeah, though, even yeah. though, it, but it was being put to a religious use, and they had mm -hmm. considered it a, a, a religious building, and just the natural yeah, I think, friction point. I think because it was abandoned helped, because it wasn't being used for anything. If anything, it was collecting dust. And I hate that, you know, you have something sitting there not being used and you say that's got to be used for something i don't care what it is i'm sure they never thought that it would be used as a hospice because this was a temple supposedly sacred temple for what they used it for to worship right, but right well i i don't know how it works in hinduism but we know that uh we've seen our churches close and not only is it heartbreaking there's a very specific ceremony mass and I swear to you, it's like a funeral. It's just like a funeral. They go over to the uh, baptismal font and they say, for all the babies that were baptized here. And they go to the kneelers, where all the brides and grooms. Oh my gosh. And by the time it's over, everybody's crying. But it's called decommissioning. And when they come out, um, the obviously the Blessed Sacrament has been taken out and they close the door and they put a blue velvet bow on the door and that's it. And by then... Everybody standing outside the door is crying, but um, I don't know if there is such a thing in Hinduism, and if there is, I don't know whether it was actually performed. I mean, you could still see when they walked in there, the goddess uh, Kali, the statue they used mm -hmm. in there, which I want to quickly mention is a god used in a franchise from a movie I think we should watch, but uh, that's something else. And um, so, I mean, it's still sitting there. But I don't think that even bothered Mother Teresa because she immediately said the first word she said was, this is perfect. Mm. So, mm -hmm. you know, just take the Hindu stuff out. And it sounded like and, they were making it into a nightclub or no, something. No. It, was, you know, it was being used as a helpful service. Yeah. Well, what bothered the, the, the locals was that it was, they saw her uh, maybe through their own ignorance, they saw her as running some sort of religious function in there which she was not true but they believed right. that she was because she was a christian nun and that was that was really they felt that was a, a sort of desecration of this former temple which they which upset them and remember the the father that had the change of heart he came out and supported her on the steps while they were stoning the the door and said she's taking in our people She's taking in Hindus to die in here. Where are you? Why haven't you done it? So I think, but wasn't there something um, nuns near a place where there was a Holocaust? Wasn't there that they were very upset about that nuns were, I guess, near the gates of uh, where the Holocaust, uh, one of the concentration camps. And the Jews were very upset about that. Oh, I do remember a story. Mm. I don't recall exactly the details. Now. But it was, you know, why are these nuns, these Christian nuns, mm -hmm. here at the gates of concentration camp? And they felt that it was a desecration. Was this during the war or after? This was recent, oh, after. more recent. Uh, uh, uh. Um, well, speaking of that fellow that came out to to defend Mother Teresa on the steps of the temple... Now, these there were a couple of guys there are the ones that wanted her gone in the beginning. Did, did that scene with the Hindus stoning the temple and their response as they departed remind you of anything? <laughs> remind you of any other stories, maybe? Does it involve the eighth row? No. Like he who has the first stone. There sin. we go. Yeah. <laughs> he was the sin. Yeah, throw the first stone. Yeah, they were. Uh, sin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it was the same, uh, similar situation. And then they all disperse with their, kind of their hat in their hands, figuratively, because they realize. Um, people forget all the time, and nuns and saints have families. I mean, you've got... Take Bishop Sheen. You've got his niece, who's 90-something, and is fighting for his 
canonization. And I have, I have um, a priest and a nun in my own family. And, you, but you forget, especially if they're your pastor or somebody in authority, you forget they have family. And I think it was a good scene to show how mother's family still meant so much to her. Um, they were trying to come for a visit. She hadn't seen him in 28 years, but the Albanian government... Um, she claimed Yugoslavia, I think, as home, but because of the governmental changes, mm -hmm. the Albanian government would not let her mother and sister travel. You know, I think it was a good thing because it made it seem more like a person. It, but remember, the basis of this movie and the basis of the letters that she wrote was about this empty, dark isolation that she was feeling more and more and more. Do you think that this, um, the permission that was not granted, do you think that that just added to the darkness of her soul? That would add her to heart? anybody's darkness mm. when you uh, are separated from your family. Uh, it's so, so wonderful, feels so good when your family is in agreement with you and encourages you. And uh, when there's silence and you don't really get to communicate, it's, it's darkness is a good description. And that comes from a guy who's worked in a lot of states away from his home. <laughs> okay, so I just said that Mother Teresa claimed to be Yugoslavian. Think of the time. Think of what was happening. We saw the scene with uh, King Edward, I guess it is, or George. I mean, it was George, King George, handing India their independence. If Mother Teresa had been English, mm -hmm. do you think she would have been as successful in postpart of India as she was? Ooh. Well, you, you mean accepted by the the people in India? Yeah, I mean I, this is I, just a hypothetical. Well, but, I mean, you know, it's it's or American or I, whatever. I'm not sure that they marked that much of a difference. It's sort of they, the they, white we, woman. Exactly. They all look alike to them. That's we right. all look alike to them. <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, they, 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 yeah, in fact, some people even remarked that, oh, it's this white woman. Right. Um, yeah, but they're, yeah, they, they were colonists for the English. And so she shouldn't have, I mean, I would have think, I would have they, thought they that, that they reaction was, they, would have been these bigger. These weren't people who were into fine distinctions. <laughs> they were, Let alone they, reading they, or writing. She was Christian, or, right? yeah, she, was Christian she was white. That was pretty much, was uh, yeah, already made her, you know, kind of a, a worthy of distrust in in their eyes. Yeah. All right. I can see that. I suppose it might have been the same with the American Indians. It didn't matter which European you were. You were still the white man. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, do you think the media of today would have been as interested in mother's work as the um, English uh, war correspondent that was trying to get the interview. Uh, today, I don't know, the media may not have been so open to, to any Catholic works in this day and age, but do you think they would have been as interested in Mother Teresa now? I mean, it all depends on the story. I mean, if you want to think about it, Spotlight was pretty modern day when they at yes, least but, the big story. But they were the media was happy to get uh, a scandal. Uh, that was a story that was, that a was scandal. negative. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> I mean, you know, there it's are, about 75 years ago now, the, right? There are all those organizations out right now that are doing like, oh, go to spread the world peace thing and uh, please donate to our cause. Well, here's a cause that is that you don't have to donate about. And I think it was, I think maybe someone would find this interesting because... It's really one woman doing this. Mm -hmm. Not really... Well, okay. The Who or, wouldn't grant an interview? <laughs> Who wouldn't grant an interview? Thanks a lot. But, uh, um, okay, she soon got a, quote, organization with the rest of the um, Ministry of Charity and the rest of the nuns that she recruited. But, for the most part, it was one person. Mm -hmm. So I think that even adds one little tiny layer over it saying huh, one person doing this out of kindness and out of the name of God might be... Maybe. A human slight, interest type of story. Slight byline. Maybe not a huge headline, but byline. Well, the... Um, first of all, I don't think she actually had to recruit that many. I think they came to her. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. I do. I do. But I... 
you know, they say that the last, well, the last couple of groups that it's okay to discriminate against or to tease isn't strong enough, abuse, <laughs> are the um, metabolically challenged, the fat, <laughs> and Christians. And I just wonder, I mean, it's a sad statement, but there are groups, there are politicians, there are uh, other religions, there are, of course, the non-religions. <laughs> and in this day and age, unfortunately, um, it's kind of okay to pick on the Catholics and the Christians. Um, so I'm not sure if you would get that that great a story, or maybe you would, maybe you would, um, but I don't know, in this day and age, it kind of frightens it's, me in a yeah, way. Yeah, it's, in a way, it's hard to imagine the media would be interested in, in such a, a story. In fact, she even had detractors, uh, you know, I remember at the, you know, shortly after she died, there were people who were saying that her work, you know, really didn't help anybody, and, mm -hmm. and, and which, of course, they missed the point of what she was doing. Right. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that, that, yeah, it's hard to imagine that the, the, the media has become so cynical now that, uh, that they would not in, be interested in the least in this sort of thing. But you never know. It, it takes an individual, I think, like the, uh, journalist who happened to be there to pick up on it. Frankly, I wanted to grab her by her skinny little shoulders and say, don't you get it, mother? You could probably keep your mission going if you would just take a little free publicity from the interview. <laughs> yeah. But you need a publicist, you mean. Yeah, there you go. And that was part of the problem with the Nobel Peace Prize. Right. Um, she finally, somebody finally got to her and convinced her of it, and then the money they would have spent on a banquet she requested to go to the uh. poor. Um, but, yeah, I it just... This was pre-internet, pre, I mean, we barely had telephones at that point, or at least international telephones. And I just wanted to say, come on, Mother Teresa, <laughs> take advantage of this. But when she was speaking to the reporter, who was actually a radio reporter, but he was taking notes, she called herself a pencil in God's hand. Okay, what did she mean by that? Why? Uh, that was pretty. That was the one of the nicest things in the movie to mm -hmm. have that to uh, symbolize all, all the things that were happening that good things were happening because God made them happen just uh, it expresses the uh, the theme he was working through her in other words well, I guess didn't she say her uh, her prayer St. Francis make me an instrument Mm -hmm. That's right. That's so right. the instrument was a pencil. Or Very popular it, among sisters that prayer. And I mean, like it's also the uh, the idea of the whole God is a sculptor, we are the clay, that type mm -hmm. of thing. Maybe he's That's an right. artist, and we are a pencil. Or something there you like go. That. There you go. Okay, now here's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Why, after dedicating her life to God, and the poorest of the poor, would God? abandon her um or did he i mean this was a theme this is pretty much the main theme of the movie because it was the movie was taken from the letters that she actually wrote to her spiritual director and the depth of the loneliness and the feel of an abandonment i don't think anybody including her believed that she really was abandoned but it was the feeling of abandonment that she had so did God abandon her or did or did he and she, and there's a quote she had more depths of holiness than the room full of cardinals why the darkness why the emptiness when all she did was just love and follow God explain that one to me well I think she had a very high standard how many people have God speak to you well me? you have a point there and then God doesn't speak to you again I mean <laughs> Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Right. How many people have that? She had a very high standard. You only get it once. You only get it once. You, you do. You do it, and then you know, radio silence. But right. Yeah. It's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's. I find it interesting that they never actually quoted from any of these letters directly. Now, maybe they were forbidden to do such a thing. No, actually, they, well, I don't think we were told they were quote so much as 
there were there the, was a the dialogue the, the 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 events that occurred were all came from those letters. right the the general message was there uh, but there was no actual quotations that I recall uh, um, but it in any case it, yeah it's it's um she she was sort of you know living the you know doing everything that she felt she was being told to do and yet somehow didn't achieve that that sense of peace that you often associate with those who are leading holy lives. I guess it's not totally uncommon among some of the saints that they go through this. Or have um, suffer like Padre Pia. Mm, right. They suffer all their lives. Right. Right. Was it wrong of Mother Teresa to not include evangelization or conversions in her mystery, in her ministry? I mean, wouldn't that have added another facet or dimension to her cause? And do you think there was an obligation there that she should have? That's that's an interesting question. I I think it's all about calling. And you can be called to do different things. And she was called to serve the poor with with charity. And that was her calling. And there were other she had her her their her sisters in the her cloistered sisters who were called to a contemplative life and stayed in the in the convent and the then sisters others, of Loretto that the, was you know, sisters of Loretto who 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 really were there to be in cloistered nuns um, and and there are those who are called to evangelize and I'm not sure that she, it was any lack of her part that that was not her calling. That's right. That wasn't part of her mission statement from God. It was <laughs> to serve the poorest and the poor in okay. the slums. Yeah. She stayed and, in that lane. I, I agree with that. Too. Yeah, and and <laughs> as a practical so matter, it, it seems that it would have been very hard for her to do the one if she also tried to do the other. Well, you know, I probably I'm waiting for the lightning bolt to come through the window here. I probably should admit this, but I get a little tired of today's constant you got to evangelize you got to evangelize you got to evangelize okay uh, yes yes of course uh, but it seems like i don't know they're wearing the word out <laughs> and and it, it isn't necessarily everybody's call i mean if you i suppose you can say you evangelize by setting a good example le leading a good moral christian judeo-christian whatever life if you want to put that in the broad definition of evangelizing. And sure, it's great if you can get somebody to come to church with you or whatever. But I'm just not sure it's always... I think it gets overused and then it loses its impact. And isn't it we're supposed to have like... Is it, is it eight gifts of the Spirit? Mm -hmm. And pe God gives you... And maybe... The Spirit. And maybe... That's evangelizing is not part of your gifts that God has given you. No, I mean, but then you feel guilty. Oh my gosh, I'm I not know. evangelizing. You, you you look at the uh, the Mormons and they do evangelizing all the time, and they're very polite about it. And they're very polite about it. I'm still gonna say no, but uh, and uh, who, who are the ones that come to the door? Jehovah's, the, Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses. And you know that's fine if that's their mission. Sure, sure. It's and then in our in our uh, faith, it says do that, but don't do it to those extents. You don't have to knock on every door. You don't. Ha I know our church. I don't know if they still do this because of the thing or not, but I remember they they like they pushed. I, I felt like I was being pressured. Here, I want. We want you to give these cards out to people for Christmas mass. Invite someone. Tell them come to church with me. And I felt very uncomfortable with that because I because I thought yeah it's I not traditionally a Catholic thing I to do it that I, way. I don't want to say, hey, let's spend <laughs> Christmas, come to church, buddy. It's like, no, no, Father, no, I'm not going to do okay. that. Take your card back. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it all it all still should go back to calling. Also, it's probably a little unfair to. Uh, to accuse any other religious group of only doing evangelization well, because true. I'm sure well, they, no, do, no, they no, do plenty yeah. of charity I mean, every, too, but, everybody, everybody uh, does the same. But thing. it's their strong suit, yeah. traditionally. Reed began exploring ideas for an inspirational and uplifting film just before the devastating terror attacks of September 11, 2001, which forced a realization on him that would come to define this project. 
He said, I didn't know there was that kind of evil in this world until then. The attacks really brought that home. The letters became a labor of love for Reed during the 14 years. 14 years it would take to produce the film. Mm. The turning point for Reed was the discovery of a startling cache of heartfelt, formerly confidential letters written by Mother Teresa to her spiritual advisor, the Belgian Jesuit priest Celeste Van Exum, over a nearly 50-year correspondence. In her letters, some of which that were published in 2007, a book called Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, Teresa revealed a profound spiritual suffering and emptiness experienced by some other saints, often referred to as a dark night of the soul. As I said, I think there's many saints that experience that. Rhea had read all the letters that were available to the public and decided that they would make up the spine of his screenplay. To portray the sisters and students of the Loretto Convent, the Bishop of Calcutta, Maria, uh, I'm sorry, Mother Teresa's wealthy benefactors and the residents of the poverty-stricken slums, Reed cast professional actors from India's Bollywood film industry, which, believe it or not, considered to be the largest in the world. The film was shot primarily in India, with interiors shot in Goa, and a second unit filming taking place in Calcutta, Delhi, and Mumbai. The scenes featuring Max Van Saito and Rutger Hauer as Van Exum's confidant Father Benjamin Prague were shot in a 15th century London monastery. I thought that was pretty cool. The film was shot was shot there and um, it was critically received very well and um, there was you know some some reviewers that didn't think it went deep enough but it, but it was good. Um, I'm proud to say on two counts that not only do I have, it's about 500 years back in my family tree, but I actually have an Indian from India um, uh, ancestor, and I also have um, a finger rosary. If you're not familiar with those, they, they go over your finger like a ring, and they have one decade of the rosary on it. Uh, Mother Teresa came to visit Trenton. And uh, a woman I really did not know that well, but um, she had a whole bunch of these rosaries in her pocket when she met and shook hands with Mother Teresa. And she um, was kind enough to give me one of them. So I kind of like that, that link. If I could actually add something real quick. Yes? I think it's actually interesting casting for Max von Sydow to be in this film because you said he was playing the main priest, correct? Mm -hmm. um, consider this a bonus fact, I guess. Uh, von Sydow not only played the main villain of Blofeld in the unofficial Bond film of Never Say Never Again, but um, he played Jesus Christ in The Greatest Story Ever Told, so I think that was interesting casting for him. Came full circle. That's right. As the trailer says, compassion gave her purpose. Faith gave her inspiration. Courage gave her strength. St. Teresa of Calcutta, pray for us. This is Jean Verhoeven. May the angels protect you and heaven accept you. Thanks for listening. Here's a bonus feature from my other show, Verhoeven's Sake. Enjoy. Today we are most honored to have with us a very important person, Sister Nancy Whitley. She's the director of major donors development for the Sisters of Mercy in Rochester, New York, where they all talk like me. Uh, if you're from New Hampshire, you're probably aware that in 1858, Francis Ward came over uh, to Manchester and established a convent, and she's buried there. So uh, the Mercy Sisters have a strong connection to New Hampshire. So today we want to talk to Sister Nancy. You know, just one one Mercy Sister's life, and it, believe me, it's been interesting. Welcome, Sister Nancy. Thank you. It's a delight to be here with you. So, when did when would you say you got you know the call? I would say that my uh, vocation really came to mind in my senior year of high school, and probably around April or May of that year. I knew that I had to be thinking about college, and I was, 
and about my future, what I might want to do. And I saw in the Sisters of Mercy who taught me a wonderful compassion and a very joyful spirit. And I thought, you know, this is attractive to me and that this is what their life is about and what it brings about in their lives and how they share that with other people. I'd like to do that too. Okay, I know this is a hard question. It might even be unfair, but let's just see if you have an opinion on it. How do we attract more men and women to the religious life today? Or sadly, will it disappear? Now, I imagine there'll be some cloistered monks or sisters in some little place always, but in the we've seen a great decline in, in a lot of the orders. And what do you think is the future? Well, Jean, I have two answers to that question. What can we do about it? I think we need to, first of all, be ourselves be the who we are in whatever particular religious organization we are involved in, continue the mission of that particular religious order, be faithful to it. And then the second part of that question, I would say we need to depend on God. If the work of religious life is to continue, then God will give us the grace to find ways. And if it's not to continue, then we must accept that as depending that God will find new ways to help reach out to the people who we have served in the past. Um, we, we, we have no power over that. Uh, the only thing we can do is to trust, have confidence, and pray that if it is God's will, that religious will continue in various parts of the world, living out their mission as faithfully as they have in the past. Well, I, well said. I think the Catholic Church wouldn't be the Catholic Church, or at least it wouldn't look the same without all the dedicated brothers and sisters and and um, throughout the world for so many generations. It's it's sad. It's sad to see the, how it's declined. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't think you'll ever be replaced by uh, social media, Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, as far as outreach goes. I think I think you're safe there. We need you. We need you. So listen, let me thank you so much for joining us. It's a, just a treat to have you. And it's nice to uh, get a, a perspective uh, from outside New Hampshire. So thank you so much. And uh, we hope to talk to you again. Thank you, Jean. This is Jean Verhoeven. May the angels protect you and heaven accept you. Thanks for listening.